Hello, I'm Karen Ginoni. This is BBC World News Today. Donald Trump turns his fire on the key Republicans who've abandoned his campaign. In a series of furious tweets, the Republican presidential candidate calls them disloyal and accuses the House Speaker of being weak and ineffective. In Syria, Russian and government warplanes resume their bombardment of Aleppo as Russia's relations with the West plunge to a new low. Also coming up, we'll have a special report from Romania where vulnerable young girls are at risk of being trafficked into prostitution and slavery across Europe. When crossing the border, I had a gun to my head and they told me to give them the ID and to smile. And a royal first for the Duchess of Cambridge, Kate makes a solo trip to the Netherlands. Well, it was a day ago that the most senior elected Republican, Paul Ryan, said he would no longer defend or campaign for his party's candidate for the White House after Donald Trump's obscene comments about women were caught on tape. Now Mr Trump has responded, lashing out on social media in a fresh sign of the Republican Party splitting apart over his candidacy. In a tweet, Mr Trump claims he won the second debate, something which Hillary Clinton's campaign, of course, would dispute. But he says despite that, it is hard to do well when Paul Ryan and others give zero support. He goes on to describe Mr Ryan as a weak and ineffective leader and accuses him of disloyalty, but Mr Trump also appears to relish his new freedom, saying it's so nice that the shackles have been taken off and I can now fight for America the way I want to. Mr Trump's ratings have fallen in the opinion polls since the release of the video in which he made sexually aggressive comments about women. Well, let's go over to Gary O'Donoghue in Washington for us. And Gary, I mean, how isolated does Donald Trump find himself with his own party? Well, he does sound a bit isolated, doesn't he? This sort of absolute deluge of uh, postings on social media today. I mean, sounding slightly paranoid. I will teach them. He talks about the Republicans. So nice that the shackles have been taken off. I can now fight for America the way I want to. I mean, it does sound uh, a little manic, let's say. And I think that's in part uh, a response to what happened over the weekend. Obviously, with the release of the video on Friday, a lot of Republicans, some 40 members of Congress have now uh, said they won't back in, 30 of them claiming he should stand aside. And this is, this is his response. He's feeling uh, a bit uh, abandoned. Uh, he's feeling a bit isolated within the party. Uh, and uh, he's doing what he does, which is to, is to lash out, uh, lashing out much, much more at his own side than at uh, his opponent, Hillary Clinton. Yeah, it does sound as if it's only going in that direction. It's not as if he sounds like he's making any kind of overtures to try and win back Republican support. No, I mean, the interesting thing is that uh, the, the sort of structure of the Republican Party, the sort of bureaucracy, if you like, which is headed up by a man called Reince Priebus, he has said that they will continue to campaign for him, the money will continue to flow into his campaign, the organisation on the ground, such as it is, will continue to work for him. So he's got that part of it, but in a sense, without the oomph of the leadership and the big names, uh, in Republican politics, uh, he is effectively having to fight this with one hand tied behind his back. Now, they would argue, of course, that they, he's only got himself to blame for that, that the instances like the video, like a whole series of other things, uh, have made it very difficult for them to support him. But the, the bigger picture, if you like, for some of those Republicans is that there's not just a battle for the White House going on uh, at this uh, general election. Of course, there's Congress. A third of the Senate is up. There's a bunch of, of vulnerable Republican seats there. They just about have control of the Senate at the moment. And, of course, the House of Representatives, every two years, every single member of that has to be re-elected. So they're, in a sense, trying to protect the, the congressional votes for the future. Because if you can hold on to at least one House of Congress, then that does mean you have some power to control a Democratic president. Gary, stay with us. I want to just turn to the claims of more potentially damaging uh, footage emerging of Mr Trump from uh, The Apprentice uh, US TV series. The show's creator, Mark Burnett, says previously unreleased video will not be made public, though. Mr Burnett, uh, the London-born president of MGM Television, says various contractual and legal requirements prevent him from 
releasing it to Gary. I'm assuming we're talking about financial penalties here. I guess so. I mean, there will be all sorts of intricacies. I mean, this uh, this uh, series and the rights to it are now owned by a much bigger corporation. Uh, there will be contracts involving, I'm sure, Donald Trump involving the original company and the original creators, etc., etc. I'm no lawyer. I haven't even seen them. I don't think anyone has seen these contracts. So who knows what the legal position with that is. One interesting tweet from a guy who was one of the producers on the first two series of The American Apprentice, saying if we thought the Donald Trump videos were bad, he's seen a lot worse. So it's clearly someone's view that there's, uh, there's a lot to be had in those those off cuts, those, that stuff that's on the studio floor from that series. And you can be sure, of course, that because Donald Trump has been involved in, in media appearances uh, for years and years and years, he's never been shy of going on the media. You can be sure that all those other programs, all those other networks are going through those shelves, those shelves full of, of tapes, of archives of their programs, thinking, have we got anything? I'm sure they are. Gary, thank you very much. Gary O'Donoghue in Washington. It's not just the Republican Party that's divided during this election. Families are often finding themselves at odds, with some siding with Mrs Clinton, others with Mr Trump. Rajini Vaidyanathan has gone to meet one such family in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. They can't agree on a candidate. In the key battleground state of Pennsylvania, the Ingram family are facing their own conflict. Hello, my name is Kathy Ingram and I'm voting for Hillary Clinton. I'm Jay Ingram and this is my son Cade and we are voting for Trump. I think she's totally crazy because she's voting for Hillary and she thinks I'm totally crazy because I'm voting for Trump. Um, and obviously one of us is right. Hold Even though he was there. Hold it. His questions were all attacks on Trump. At dinner, talk of politics is unsurprisingly lively. Jay's vote for Donald Trump is as much a vote against Hillary Clinton, the candidate his wife Kathy's supporting. She wants to do the best for the country. so even though she has a little bit of a storied past and I think she has, you know, some ideas that, uh, that really need to be pushed through that on the Democratic side hasn't been able to you be really pushed through. Do you really think she comes off as a good person? Seriously? Yes. Oh, I, I just find her totally, she reminds me of the evil school marm, uh, the school teacher. I mean, she's, you know, she's old, she's overweight, just like, uh, some of those other like women. Mr. Trump. That's right. No, he's not. He's fine. He's 230 and hits a golf ball 280. So he's in fine shape. Thank you. A self-confessed liberal, Jay backed Bernie Sanders in this year's primaries and voted for Barack Obama to be president twice. I was gung-ho for Obama. I really believed he was going to do things. Uh, I believed what he said, the fool that I am. He seemed to like to just sit around and tell jokes and look pretty. Their elder son, Cade's getting ready to cast his ballot for the first time, and he's with his dad. Yeah, I'm voting for Trump. I, I could not bring myself to vote for Hillary. It's just, there's too many strikes against her, and a lot of people like to make excuses for what happened, but she'll, she'll literally say anything to get elected. He never threw one attack at Hillary. Everything would put Trump on no, the defense. No, he does exactly. question her about the emails. The tables are split as this state, where it's looking close between Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump. I go off every day of the week and I meet a lot of people and nobody comes out and goes, I'm voting for Trump, but they'll come up to me after I made a putt and say, I'm voting for Trump, by the way. And I go, well, why hide it? I just don't think the passion is out there behind anyone, either candidate at this point. The undecided voters in Pennsylvania are key this election. But one thing is certain, whatever the outcome, expect Sparks to fly in this house after polling day. Jeannie Vardianathan, BBC News, Lancaster. Now the mobile phone manufacturer Samsung has permanently stopped production of its latest smartphone because of safety concerns. It's told customers who have the Galaxy Note 7 device to stop using it after reports they've been catching fire. A previous attempt to fix the problem wasn't successful. With me is Robert Leedham, who's editor of the Technology magazine stuff. Robert, welcome. Your magazine loved the Note 7. They gave it a five-star rating. Five stars, yeah. Well, we tested it for two weeks. It works really well. It's very powerful, had a great camera, had a great screen, and uh, we didn't see any sign of a problem. Uh, in fact, most technology publications rated the Note 7 as highly as possible. But mm. unfortunately, 
the phone started catching fire when it got out to users. So a lot of uh, very disappointed owners as well, having to give them back. Yeah, I imagine so. I mean, it's a really unfortunate scenario for everyone involved. Uh, the Note 7 hadn't been released internationally. Uh, they took a break, effectively, with the Note 5. So this was meant to be its big return, unfortunately. I didn't turn out very well. If people have still got them, what, what are they supposed to do now? And, and what else are they going to get in return to sort of keep them communicating with the world? Okay, so this is the really important thing. So Samsung say, if you've got a Note 7, turn it off. And then you'll be able to take it back to them and get a refund on that phone. Or you can exchange it for another Samsung phone like the Galaxy S7 or S7 Edge. And both of those phones, there are no known problems with them. They're great. Now, this particular device was very, very thin. Is that possibly part of the problem? that you have to compress all this power into such a thin battery? Well, according to reports, uh, Samsung were really looking to compete with the Apple's iPhone, which has had a rather a, a middling year in terms of updates to its design. So they wanted to pack as much new technology as possible into the Note 7. And apparently, that's where the problem occurred, because a bigger battery went into this version of the Note and there wasn't any particularly more space for it, according to reports. I mean, this is a difficult thing for manufacturers to get as much power into the battery because people will complain all the time that they don't get enough uh, battery time on any device because so much is going on in those devices. Exactly. People want a better screen so they can view videos on them, they want to take more photos, and all of that is soaking up power. And most people like you and I and stuff readers, they're, they're going to want at least a day and a half out of their, their phones. So that's where the problem comes in when you're trying to, I suppose, overcompensate for, for those uh, added specs. How big a uh, catastrophe is this for Samsung? I mean, they were saying they were trying to modify it. Now it's turned to give them, turn them off and give them back. I mean, how bad is it when they are up against people like Apple and Google? Well, I think it, it, it's not good, is it? Uh, no manufacturer wants their products to start setting on fire. I think the real consequences are going to show uh, when the Note 7 uh, Fivore blows over and Samsung are releasing their new S8 and S8 Edge phones next year. Then you're going to be able to tell how much damage has happened, occurred to the brand in terms of sales, really. And in the meantime, you've got companies like Apple with their iPhone 7 and Google, which is about to release its uh, first ever own brand phone in the coming weeks, uh, able to take advantage of a gap in the market. Robert, thank you very much. Robert Leadham of Stuff magazine, thank you. A look at some of the day's other news stories. And Afghan's interior ministry says 14 people have been killed after armed men in the capital Kabul attacked a Shia shrine. 26 others were injured in the attack. The Katisaki shrine was packed with people marking Ashura, a day of mourning in the Shia calendar commemorating the death of Imam Hussein. Iranian football fans have watched their national team beat South Korea 1-0 in a World Cup qualifier despite the constraints imposed by that Shia Muslim holiday. Throughout the match, Tehran's Azadi Stadium was a sombre scene packed with tens of thousands of Iranians instructed to wear black in honour of Imam Hussein. Fans were requested to refrain from cheering on their team and instead raised clenched fists and chanted Ya Hussein. Britain's Foreign Secretary Boris Johnson says Russia risks becoming a pariah nation if it continues on its current path in Syria. The comments were made during an emergency debate on the conflict in the British Parliament. Meanwhile, Russia's President Vladimir Putin called off a planned visit to Paris after the French President Francois Hollande said Russia could face war crimes prosecution for its aerial bombing campaign in Aleppo. James Landale reports. <laughs> Another little girl pulled from the rubble of eastern Aleppo. Another child left orphaned by a war that has devastated so many lives. Today, Russian warplanes resumed their bombing of rebel-held districts, a bloody campaign that MPs debated for the first time in months. Are we so cowed, so polaxed by recent history in Iraq and Afghanistan that we are incapable now of taking action? Was all the international hand-wringing after Rwanda, Bosnia, Srebrenica, when we said never again, just so much hot air. The pictures we see make us want to close our eyes, to turn away from the horror. But we cannot unsee what we have seen, and we must not turn our backs on the greatest crime of our century. Listening to that on the front bench for the first time in his new job was the Foreign Secretary. He tore into Russia, calling for fresh sanctions and demonstrations outside Russian embassies. If Russia continues in its current path, 
then I believe that great country is in danger of becoming a pariah nation. And if, if President Putin's strategy is to restore the greatness and the glory of Russia, then I believe he risks seeing his ambition turn to ashes. So what options did MPs suggest? Well, some called for a no-fly zone over Aleppo, but that would involve the West being prepared to destroy Russian and Syrian warplanes and air defences. Some called for more aid to be dropped by plane, but this can often land in the wrong place. And others called for yet more diplomacy, and if that failed, more economic sanctions. We do need to explore no-fly and no-bombing zones. We do look, need to look at the question of airdrops. What people in Syria need is bread, not bombs. Any war crimes by air forces will be logged. In a multi-layered, multi-faceted civil war such as Syria, the last thing we need is more parties bombing. So the mood of the House of Commons was clear. The West should do more to confront Russia and the Syrian government, potentially even with the use of military force. But the Foreign Secretary was much more cautious, warning that the consequences of no-fly zones would have to be thought through very, very carefully. For the people living here in the ruins of Aleppo, what matters is not the words of Western policymakers, but an end to the violence. And there's no sign of that coming soon. James Landell, BBC News. Haiti's government has warned that the country faces real famine following the apocalyptic destruction of Hurricane Matthew. The UN's called for a massive response to help the country recover from the aftermath of the Category 4 storm believed to have killed as many as 900 Haitians. UNICEF's representative in Haiti, Marc Vincent, is on the line from the city of Le Quay, one of the worst hit by the hurricane. Marc Vincent, thank you for talking to us. Just tell us what the situation is like there today. Well, uh, this, our teams and working with uh, uh, government partners and NGO partners are doing all they can right now to make sure that they can get clean water uh, to the most affected population. Uh, as you know, the UN released an appeal uh, yesterday, uh, and we are estimating that uh, 2.1 million people have been affected by this storm, and 1.4 million are in urgent need of assistance. So for UNICEF, the first priority is to get clean water, uh, drinkable water to the population in order to be able to control uh, outbreaks of, of waterborne diseases. We're also really working with the, the Ministry of Education here to try and see how we can rehabilitate some of the 300 plus schools that have been damaged by the storm so that we can ensure that uh, up to 100,000 children uh, don't lose uh, the school year is a result of, uh, of, of, of a lack of access to schools, but also they've lost uniforms, they've lost their books, and of course the teachers are in the same communities and they've also lost everything as well. So we're working closely with the Minister of Education to see how we can prioritise uh, schools and, and, and get to as many children as we can. Uh, and what, issue, sorry to interrupt sorry. you, I just wanted to ask you what access is like, how easy is it to get to uh, the people who are in need of all this help? Well, I think uh, somewhere we, when I was speaking to our teams yesterday, I think we had reached uh, a little over 60% of the, of the communes in the two affected areas. Uh, we're still being blocked in, in terms of some of the more remote communities, especially the communities in the highlands, um, where it's very difficult to get trucks in and to get, uh, to get uh, uh, water bladders and those sorts of uh, larger equipment in. So access is still, is still a challenge. How concerned are you? We've been hearing a lot about worries to do with the, an outbreak of cholera uh, potentially there in the worst affected parts. Well, as I said, clean water is the first, uh, uh, the first line of defense in terms of uh, access or, or uh, controlling the outbreaks of cholera. Uh, we have been working very closely again with the Ministry of Health, uh, with our NGO partners and with uh, POW or WHO OMS to try and reach uh, those communities affected with medical teams, but also to reach them with um, immediate uh, water purification uh, uh, supplies, buckets and so forth, so that they can ensure that they have access to, uh, to, to clean water. We're also mobilizing now as we speak with our partners uh, up to 26 teams, rapid response teams that will be able to go out to these communities as soon as, of course, we have, uh, we have access. Marc Vincent, we appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Uh, that's Marc Vincent, who's the UNICEF representative in Haiti, speaking from one of the worst affected towns.
On Wednesday, Britain's Prime Minister Theresa May is expected to highlight the problem of modern slavery during a speech at Westminster Abbey. Thousands are being trafficked into the UK and other nations forced into prostitution or domestic slavery. Many come from a handful of countries, including Romania, where sex trafficking has become widespread. From there, Naomi Grimley sends this report. Mihaela, who's 26, is a survivor of human trafficking. And here, in a women's shelter in Bucharest, she's trying to rebuild her life. Looking on is her baby girl, fathered by her last trafficker. She was trafficked not once, not twice, but three times around Europe. When crossing the border, I had a gun to my head, and they told me to give them the ID and to smile. In the mornings and afternoons, I'd have 15 clients. Then in the evenings through to the next morning, they'd bring another 20. In the end, it was a client racked with guilt who helped her to escape. Many of the victims of trafficking come from remote villages. Nicarest in eastern Romania appears stuck in a bygone era. Many of the houses don't have running water. The traffickers have targeted this place and the British woman who runs the local community centre says a girl goes missing every month. The girls get involved through the lover boy scheme. They're mostly young, vulnerable teenagers um, who fall in love with the pimps, who are, are normally older guys. Um, the girls are very attracted by the Mercedes and the Audis that the, the, the pimps are driving around in. Juana was trafficked to Germany for prostitution. Now, with her life back on track, she's come to the community centre to warn the local kids of the dangers. I tell two girls to don't trust guys so easy. Juana hopes she'll make the village's teenagers think twice. A village like Nicarest really struggles to offer its young the jobs and the opportunities that they might want in the 21st century. And the traffickers exploit that. They act, in effect, like real-life Pied Pipers. We went to a jail an hour north of Bucharest to meet a man who trafficked women and girls to Italy for five years. He claims he didn't use any force. I don't know if it is exploitation, but when the girl agrees, I don't think that this is exploitation. But how would you feel if it was your sister or your daughter being trafficked? You really don't think that it's someone's daughter. You think just that you have to make money and that's it. Would you do it again? Yes. You would? Yes. Why? After all I've done, they have taken everything from me. I've got nothing. I have to start again from scratch. So I wouldn't be sorry to do it all again. In Nicarest, the worry is another three girls might be gone by Christmas. Some may go willingly to escape their poverty, but the life that awaits them, no one could ever knowingly wish for it. Naomi Grimley, BBC News, Eastern Romania. The Duchess of Cambridge has made her first solo overseas trip. She's been in the Netherlands for a day of engagements, including discussions on mental health issues and a visit to see some old masters. Here's Nicholas Witchell. His report does contain flash photography. Going solo abroad for the first time, the Duchess of Cambridge on a mission of more than usual significance. This is a moment when Britain needs to cultivate friendships in Europe. Britain's links with the Netherlands go back centuries. So when the House of Windsor, represented by Catherine, met the House of Orange, represented by King Willem Alexander, the image that was being projected was of two European countries with shared history and many shared interests, not the least of which is that each is a huge export market for the other. No one, of course, was crude enough to mention the word Brexit. That's for the politicians. Theresa May was here just yesterday canvassing support from the Dutch Prime Minister. Art is more Catherine style. She visited the Hague's Royal Gallery to view paintings, including Vermeer's Girl with a Pearl Earring. But what the spectator with the pearl earrings was demonstrating was the art of soft diplomacy. Visiting a gallery or joining an art workshop may not be very demanding, but the importance of a visit such as this shouldn't be underestimated. 
Members of the royal family don't do politics, but they do do diplomacy of the soft and subtle variety, promoting Britain's image and reputation abroad. So visits such as this to important European allies have a new significance. Memo then to the royal tour organisers. Catherine led the way in the Netherlands. The rest of Europe beckons. Nicholas Witchell, BBC News, in The Hague. Finally, scientists have obtained remarkable new insights into the environmental catastrophe caused by an asteroid that hit the Earth some 66 million years ago. They found that life returned relatively quickly to the site after the impact of the 15 kilometer wide object, widely thought to have wiped out the dinosaurs. Researchers have been examining rocks from inside the massive crater, 100 kilometers wide and 30 kilometers deep, it formed in what is now the Gulf of Mexico. They found small organisms that evolved in the first few thousand years after the impact. That's all from the current Genoni in London. Thanks for watching.